Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Alicia Michelson, and I am the Artistic Director at Peninsula School of Art in Fish Creek, Wisconsin. I am honored to introduce our newest pair of artists in residence, Emily McBride and Sarah Stellman. Emily and Sarah are with us for a total of six weeks in an immersive studio experience that prioritizes time and space for them to engage fully in their creative practice, experiment, and pursue new projects and ideas. Today, we have the opportunity to get to know each of them and their work through brief image presentations. First, we'll hear from Emily. Emily McBride is an artist, craftsperson, and designer residing in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Her luminous glass forms use repetitive and meditative processes that navigate a simple complexity. Emily earned her MFA in Craft Material Studies from Virginia Commonwealth University in 2016 and her BFA in Glass from Tyler School of Art at Temple University in 2009. In 2022, Emily was named one of 10 artists in the nation for the Emerging Artist Cohort with the American Craft Council. Also in 2022, she was a visiting artist at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, and a craftsperson in residence at Pilchuck Glass School. Take it away, Emily. Hi, my name is Emily McBride. I currently live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm a multimedia artist, formerly trained in glass. So while my art, while I make art using photography, collage, and other malleable materials, my primary craft is in glass which I work in throughout the year, making sculptural objects and designing tableware and home decor. Glass is often a team sport, requiring one to schedule time and assistance. It is a privilege to work in this material. And as the learning curve is steep, the cost of studio and rental classes are expensive. I find it to be unlike any other medium with its ability to mold and bend and refract light and first transparency. There is also precarity to working in glass. Not only can it break with one wrong move, but one's body could fail them or the studio you rent could shut down or you might not be able to afford the expenses. Swell so is an infinite in its possibilities of forms that can take. It can also be limiting. And for me, I find it important not to be exclusively a glass artist. I heard another former Penn Art resident say that post-education, they worked in art adjacent jobs. My art adjacent job is in arts administration at a nonprofit glass art center called FOSI, Minnesota Center for Glass Arts. There, I manage a retail and exhibition space, along with the many other hats that are required for one to wear while working in a nonprofit. While my art adjacent job is fulfilling, my primary goal for this year and the foreseeable future is to make art making my priority, using sales from my glass production line to help pay the bills. With my glass design work, I craft curious glass objects for the home. Using bold colors and patterns, I create purposeful glass objects that inspire desire to touch, hold, and use, while bringing light and color into the home. While I can see threads that link my design work to my sculptural work, I often see them as separate sides to my practice. With the bright, beautiful drinkware and vases being like an antithesis to the more moody, darker, even subversive elements to my sculptural and collage work. I feel that I need to satisfy both sides of my art making urges. So I'll back home, I primarily focus in, I've been primarily focusing and developing my design brand. I'm choosing to dedicate chunks of my time and mindset to my sculptural practice in the form of residencies which is what I'm here at Penn Art to pursue and the type of work I'm going to be sharing with you going forward. I work in conglomerates and piles, aroused by the visual noises in my periphery. Working in image and object, I alter material and surface to transform the residue of urban and natural landscapes into unfamiliar curiosities. I've come to this work from a background in craft and a compulsion to make. I'm trained as a glassblower and obsessed with malleability and touch. Yet I'm drawn to digital mediums because they are intangible and allow me to create with immediacy and scale without physical consequence. The piles I create represent psychological states of anxiety and desire and allow me to explore excessive tendencies, not to hoard, but to accumulate and let go. So this work is from my thesis exhibition in 2016 called So Much Apparent Nothing. With this work, I confront my personal philosophies surrounding awareness and temporality by subtly skewing the recognizability of familiar materials and imagery. 
The pile is a digital collage of dirty sidewalk snow, and the traffic cone is blown glass with a surface that has been molded to have the impression of my fingerprints throughout it. I'm really drawn to snow and its dualities. When it first falls, it's really beautiful and blankets everything with a glistening layer, but soon it transitions into slush and ice, mixing with cinders and dirt. For something that will eventually just melt into the ground, it is so disruptive and removed by truckloads from the city center. You can't tell from the slides, but in person, this print is covered with a thick layer of Vaseline, adding depth and tactility and slipperiness to the image. I grew up in rural northeastern Pennsylvania. My dad was and still is a construction worker. This is me when I was 10, working with him magging concrete footers for one of his jobs. When my brother and I were kids, he would occasionally take us to work with him. And as we got older and more capable, he would actually put us to work. My brother was less into manual labor, but I really took to it. During my summer breaks from college, I was a full-time concrete mason, pouring driveways, sidewalks, footers, foundations, and laying block. In the evenings, my dad would teach me how to read blueprints and calculate concrete yardage. During these years, I developed my physical strength, appreciation for material, and desire for making with my hands. Still, I find I'm drawn to the aesthetics of construction sites, the piles of debris, and the bright colors intended to declare potential danger. I photograph elements from my daily surroundings, common places I pass on walks, construction site debris, mounds of dirty snow, and nature and trash and discarded items and materials and elements that are meant to draw our attention, yet are so commonplace that they no longer do. These visuals influence my object making in color, texture, line, and form. In the studio, I stretch hot glass into simple components over and over. On a computer, I alter photographs by copy-paste, copy-paste. Working in repetitive processes in physical and digital forms allows my work to quickly amass into conglomerates that verge on the surreal. This piece is of a few hundred glass double ring loops that I made by wrapping lengths of hot glass around a steel pipe and is assembled together with cable ties. It's sort of a highbrow, lowbrow material combination. This collage was created from imagery of crumpled rebar and concrete from the demolition of the portion of the I-35W highway running through my neighborhood, which is shut down for reconstruction from 2017 to 2021 when printed uh, is about eight feet tall by 16 feet wide. This is another work from that series. The gallery had this interesting wall with shells built into it that I thought would be a cool opportunity to pair with 3D forms in a 2D print. The images of discarded bent pipes from the highway demolition. The objects are assembled hot glass loops that are painted with a high vis rubber coating. In installation, the 3D objects are often paired with prints of digital collages. The collages are sometimes derived from photographs of what the objects were inspired by. Other times, the collages are manipulated images of the objects themselves. When I print the images, I've historically printed them on inexpensive copy paper, which is not archival, but I like that aspect of it. If it tears or eventually disintegrates, it's okay. Working this format feels less consequential. It's not a precious object to take care of, that used a bunch of resources to make. So I find the material contrast between glass and this image making to be really interesting. The prints often require being precisely cut out and pieced together. So the prints always feel really tactile and handled to me, which contrasts with how they are made digitally. Coming from the standpoint of someone who is heavily involved in the craft world, I still see this type of making as craft, or as I jokingly like to say, it's post-craft. Most recently, I completed a local residency in Minneapolis at Chicago Avenue Fire Arts Center. During this time, I was able to dive into a specific technique called networking, which bends and fuses thin glass rods using a small hand torch. To develop my skills in this technique, I continue to explore the motif of meshes, grids, and nets. These are some images from my culminating exhibition. During the residency, I really only had time to focus on the glass iterations of this new work. I plan to use these objects as a jumping off point to inform the image-based work they'll be working on during my time here at Penn Art. So thank you, Peninsula School of Art, for this opportunity. I'm really excited to see what I produce here during my time. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Also in residence is Sarah Stellman. 
Sarah lives and works in Austin, Texas. She earned her BFA in studio art with a minor in art history from the University of Texas at Austin in the fall of 2020. Sarah's paintings explore sentimentality, remembered images, and special things. The subjective distortion of recollected images influences the way she renders and collages objects and spaces together. She creates what she thinks of as mental landscapes where a narrative can unfold. Sarah's work has been included in solo and group exhibitions around the country, including a recent solo exhibition titled Things Aren't How They Used to Be and They Never Were at R&D Gallery in Madison, Wisconsin. Let's hear from Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Stellman, and I'm a painter living and working in Austin, Texas, and I'm really excited to be here at the Peninsula School of Art. So thank you to the school and everyone who's a part of it. So I want to start off with some of my earlier work. This is a painting from 2021 and is sort of the beginning of the path that I've continued to go down in terms of my process and imagery and some of the tools and materials that I use. I mainly pull from domestic spaces and everyday routines for the imagery that I use in my work. I'm interested in exploring personal traditions and routines through the accumulation of objects and images that dictate these daily rituals. I'm exploring personally meaningful items and scenes and more universally meaningful or valuable things. I'm interested in the inherent specialness of some objects and spaces and how they interact with more utilitarian or dispensable things and the intricacies of those relationships. As I use, reuse, manipulate, and rework the imagery that I collect, the process of painting becomes a routine in itself consisting of a series of steps and processes that I repeat, sometimes to a point where the original shapes and images I'm pulling from merge with other shapes or evolve into something entirely new. The process of layering, repeating, and covering up or revealing portions of the surface is one of both mundanity as well as discovery and spontaneity. Uh, in the same way that the process or the painting becomes part of a routine, the finished painting becomes a constructed object with an inherent specialness because of the amount of time I've spent with it. To expand on the idea of something fluctuating between being mundane and novel, I wanna talk about my process. Um, I typically work on a rigid surface, usually a primed wood panel that allows me to apply layers of paint and then rework the surface by scraping, sanding, or wiping away outer layers to reveal the earlier layers. This can be a repetitive process in which I oscillate between adding and subtracting layers to create a more complex surface. So there's a redundancy in repeatedly adding and covering up images painted on the surface, but an element of newness in uncovering parts of the painting and discovering how they interact with newer elements of the painting. So moving along, I'm getting into work from 2022 and 23. Uh, I'm starting to think about how my process lends itself to creating a sense of time within the painting by providing visual evidence of the time spent creating the surface. So I'm experimenting with different indications of time passing in a painting, like intensely detailed or precise mark making, translucent layers of paint that veil earlier iterations of the painting, or windows into earlier versions of the painting. Uh, careful mark making versus marks with a sense of immediacy. Also, light and shadow, and how it can how it can communicate the time of day, the atmosphere, location, and how it can elicit different feelings. Because my process is so important in my paintings, I think it's fairly evident in them rather than transcribing a planned out composition onto the surface. I start out rather recklessly mapping out areas of the painting, covering up portions, and creating a compositional problem for myself to solve. 
through the process of um, chaos and discovery, I like to think of the final painting as a sort of revelation. It's a long series of problems that I'm solving and picking and choosing what portions of the image make it into the final painting. And I'm looking for and looking to create a visual logic amongst the chaos of the beginning stages. Painting for me is a unique way of telling a story in which the narrative and context can be really fluid. I like to think of the narratives of my paintings as non-linear and that the relationships between the objects or images don't have a clear sequence or a message to communicate, but rather the presumptions of the viewer can influence the way the image is interpreted and the interpretation can change as the image is perceived and objects are recognized or associations are made. So in contrast to, say, a photograph that is capturing a moment or a scene, I'm using painting to build an image and build a story through an accumulation of captured moments. I'm taking objects out of their original context and using them to create a new object, the object being the painting. In some of my larger work, I think the sense of space plays more of a role, but it's still secondary to the objects that occupy it. Uh, I look for ways to contradict or confuse the sense of space or interrupt the logic of the painting, and I look for ways that objects can contain a space rather than be contained by a space which is related to the way um, the stencils that I use operate. I typically make stencils by either cutting them by hand or having them laser cut. And the stencils allow me to really quickly repeat and manipulate imagery. My stencils and the other collected items I use to create my paintings serve as a catalog or a database of entirely independent objects that accumulate in the painting to create a context for themselves through their association with each other. In the way that a stencil contains and controls a shape, I think the objects that I create using the stencil serve to dictate the space that they occupy. Rather than being logically situated in a believable space, I'm creating space around the objects. The stencils themselves become their own meaningful objects and they also maintain a sense of time and touch in the way they become worn out. The edges become softer and sometimes the images become warped. So stencils that I use repeatedly in different paintings sometimes evolve. Last year, I started experimenting with monotype printmaking, which was really exciting to me because it can be a really fast paced project process. Uh, generally, my work is really time consuming. And so monotype provided an opportunity to really shift my process of image making to be much more intuitive and allowed me to quickly experiment. The process that I've been using involves applying ink to a plexiglass matrix and using stencils and other found materials to block areas of the matrix before running it through the press. So this process has allowed me to use a lot of the same tools that I would in my paintings, such as the stencils, but it really expedites the process. So the monotypes that I've been making help inform my paintings by allowing me to quickly experiment with different compositions and sometimes create unexpected results that I'm then able to reference and use as a tool in my painting practice. At this point, um, I have a significant collection of stencils, collected images and items, and monotype prints that I'm able to draw from and I'm continuing to build my collection. So I'm always finding new imagery to experiment with, but I'm also thinking about new ways to construct paintings using the tools that I already have and discovering new relationships between them and new ways to expand and develop my visual language. It was a pleasure to hear from both of you today. 
Toward their end of their residency, we will be hosting an in-person end of session studio tour on May 4th from 3.30 to 5 p.m. This event is in conjunction with the reception for our current exhibition, Time and Space, a Survey of Artists and Residents, which features work from the prior seven cohorts of residents. If any of you tuning in are in the area, I hope you will join us and see what Emily and Sarah have been working on during their time with us. In the meantime, please follow us on social media for more behind the scenes updates. Thanks so much.